Hi guys, welcome into the ADAD studio where Patrick is actually in charge, he's the head engineer of this studio. And we have a beautiful ADAD NIF console that I'm not really familiar with. Could you please, Patrick, tell us a little bit about the studio, your history, how you ended up uh, getting in here? So basically your journey to the Galaxy Studio. I was uh, 18 years old when I had to decide what to do. And uh, I was a musician. I was a, still am a French horn player. All so right. more from the classical side That's of cool. the music. And basically I always wanted to do something with music. And a friend of mine uh, was studying um, sound engineering in Dusseldorf, a tonemeister course actually, okay. at uh, Robert Schumann, uh, music high school and uh, he said oh you know what come along this is very interesting even though you're not very technical i wasn't technical at all, at all. i come from the music side of things and i went there i visited him and i thought oh that's not bad let's apply for a for a place there lucky enough to get there so i studied there for five years uh, tonmeister i wanted to come back to, to work in belgium <laughs> and I was Googling and always the first thing came up was Galaxy Studios, Galaxy Studios, Galaxy Studios. I wrote an email to Wilfried van Baalen, who yeah. is the owner. I got an answer 45 minutes after I sent my email. <laughs> okay. He sent an email back and said, oh, this sounds interesting. And um, we had a talk uh, two weeks later. I was here. He said, well, it's, it's great that you have this kind of education because that's what he had as well. He's a classical musician. Uh, he is an organ player, was... basically. And before that, he was a trumpet player. So already there was a, a very quick uh, click. link, yeah. a click between us. And he said, yeah, I'm actually looking for a, an assistant engineer here. But before you, you can get that, we have kind of an internship period uh, that you have to do. And uh, this will be like, you know, between six and eight months and unpaid. Yep, a lot of commitment, I guess. And I thought, I have to start here, internship, eight months, not unpaid. That's not fair. But then I thought, oh, I saw this place and I mean, Obviously, you guys have seen it. It's just an amazing place. I just this want to sleep a, in here, man. A very, very big chance for me. And I thought, you know what? Consider it being like an extension of your studies. Yeah, you, you, it's a nice way of exactly. looking at it. So this will be my internship at the end of my studies and I will learn some stuff. But then very quickly, I started here as, as Wilfried's assistant. And um, very quickly, he left to me all decisions about which microphones to put where. This gave me the possibility of learning a lot of things without having the pressure to be the responsible one for it, yeah. you know? So I could test out things, I could change microphones, I could change uh, setups, I could change preamps, um, while he would come in and he would think, oh, or tell me afterwards, I've never heard our string section sound so good like this, what did you do? <laughs> So I, I was just experimenting without having to deliver the, the result because he was responsible for Correct. it. Correct. I built uh, an enormous uh, treasure of experience by this. I did that for three, four years with Wilfried. And then basically he, um, yeah, he went more into managing and he yeah. didn't have the time for producing and engineering anymore. And he left more and more things to me. Also like whole projects and finishing it, like also mixing uh, stuff that we recorded or <laughs> projects that would come in just for mixing. He would leave them for me and he would concentrate on managing the company. And that's actually how it started. And um, in 2008, um, our first film score came in that we had to, uh, to mix like a big orchestra film score. And since it's very related to what I've always been doing before, like also playing in, in orchestras, this is recording an orchestra and mixing in a special way. Film music is, is not the, the classical way, but a very uh, creative way of it mixing is. classical it, music. It needs to go say. with the pictures. Exactly. Yeah. And also sometimes with synthesizers and stuff With like sound that. effects. And so I yeah. actually, he threw me in the cold water. He said, oh, there's a film score we need to record and mix. Can you do it? And I said, yeah, never done it before. And I've been specializing and I've been uh, developing workflows here together with my team so that we are very pro professional on, on, a, on a par with London Studios, yeah. which are famous for film score recordings. Yeah, and um, basically this has made us over the years to one of the only addresses in Belgium where you really can record film music on a professional yeah, lab. We had the infrastructure right from the start because of Wilfried's vision of how he wanted the studio to be built. And then what we brought into it is basically the, the professionalism of the team and the workflows. How can you record things quickly? How can you mix and like record stems at the same time without losing time by printing yeah. multiple stems and stuff like that? Uh, so you develop your own way of working. Absolutely. You know, to speed up and the and um, 
of course worked with external engineers that eventually would come here and would tell me many london engineers came here and, and tell you talk so they would say oh we, we do it this way and you guys do it that way that's great what you do but this i would rather do like this For so this we learn that's that's good from other people and other people see how we do it and are quite impressed with what we do yeah being a little studio in the no middle of nowhere in belgium and not being in london or hollywood or new york which to um, me is also one of the secrets of this place. Clients appreciate that a lot because basically when you're here, you're working all day long in noise. Yeah. I mean, don't call it noise, call it music, yeah. but uh, you hear sound all the time. So it's really, really nice. And after having finished, after having wrapped up at night, you go out and you sit on the terrace, you have a beer exactly. together or a glass of wine or water, yeah. or whatever, and you, you hear yeah some okay. birds and it nature. Itself, yeah. Right? So that's, that's actually very good. And if you have to stay for a week, if you do a recording, like I'm talking now, the composer, the engineer or whatever, or even a band that is recording here, they really love the evenings outside and, and the quiet uh, and the fact that they can go out of a terrace door and see the cows yeah. five meters yeah. away. Uh, it, is, it is nice. It is very relaxing to work in this environment. So in terms of work, I would like really to ask you, what is the main work you do in here? You do tracking, you do mixing, both things? I do mainly both. There's three situations. One situation is that I do only tracking, the recording right. side, and then the client leaves with the stuff. And the funny thing is that uh, it's common for certain uh, productions that come from certain countries, I would say. Okay. For instance, uh, we have uh, quite some French productions that come here to record film scores. Um, but they tend to prefer to mix in Paris or at home with their own people and with, with known engineers. Um, yeah. Compared to that, for instance, the British, they like very much coming over here and staying here and then also work with the people that are on, on site or bringing their own engineers over here then they mix here. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I do, for the French guys, I do a lot of recordings and they go back again. Then for the British guys, um, I do both. Either they go back or they stay here. And for everything other than, like, say, everything that's Benelux, they come here and, and record and mix. And some of them just come here for mixing because often the local market doesn't have the budgets for big recordings in Belgium because the price of the musicians are quite expensive yeah. compared to Eastern Europe, for instance, Prague, Sofia, yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah. Skopje and Macedonia. So I, I have a couple of clients that um, go and record over there and then they would come here and, and spend the ma main part of their budget that they have to get the quality mixes. So they mix with me here um, uh, because otherwise, I mean, over there you can't really mix. You can record cheap, I would yeah. say. But then you have the, the files, but you can't really... I mean, yeah, it mix. always comes down to the, the bu budget. I understand this is very much your home, this space, <laughs> this room itself. You work on the vast majority of your project within this uh, control room, right. onto this desk. Yep. So would you mind tell us a little bit more about this ADAD desk? I'm not really familiar with it. Okay, so the ADAD desk is basically Amos Neve's uh, flagship uh, in digital music production. Right. Um, it is a sister console, I would say, with the DFC, the digital film console yep. of MS Neve, which is very, very um, known and, That's and very also very see, yeah. widely spread uh, in, in the world of uh, audio post-production. This is the biggest uh, ATAT that you can find on the planet. Okay. Not only in terms of uh, channels, I mean, it's a 48 uh, fader frame. Yeah. But basically, it has uh, 1,000 channels in uh, eight, 48 kilohertz, and it has 500 channels in uh, 96 kilohertz yeah. internally. It's uh, set up in, in layers and banks. So basically, if you press these buttons, gotcha. you have 24 different layers that you can call to the surface. Why 88D? It yeah. has uh, the only um, common thing it has with the 88R is the 88. Okay. That's all. That's the name. Okay. Um, and basically, the idea behind that is because the 88R is the analog flagship. Yeah. They wanted to to make the digital flagship sound, you know, like the within the, the same within lineage. the same name. Yeah. But other than that, there is there's not really a comparison possible. Um, this console has been custom. Uh, changed into a 3D ready console, so Oro 3D right. mixing is, is uh, possible on this desk. This one was the first in the world. 
basically because obviously Auto 3D has been you invented at, and developed uh, by Galaxy Studios. Yeah. And then uh, we always uh, called Amos and Eve and said, look guys, we need this, we need that. We really do. Programmed some stuff, sent over new software and we would install it here and then do weeks and weeks of beta testing. And, and see how it yeah, runs. In the beginning it was kind of a nightmare, but uh, <laughs> now it's a very, very stable and very nice sounding uh, desk and I love working with it. Handling, it's very analog. It's a very analog ergonomics. Um, you yeah. have all your 48 faders uh, and channel strips, basically, where you can put your EQs, Bottom. your compressors, uh, filters, whatever you want, your auxiliaries. Yeah. So you select it on the channel itself, but you can also have everything centered on the um, center section. Right. If you access a channel, then this channel will move into the center channel and um, you can have all the functions in one view and can manipulate things uh, here. Yeah, he has some LCD screens on mm -hmm. top, so where you can actually have some uh, yeah metering references. Right. Can show up, uh, I guess, yeah, different EQ curves if you have a compression yeah. setting, yeah, boxes. But you can also see it on the strip themselves as well. Yeah. Just need to know where to hit the right button, and there you go. Now we're looking at the EQs onto that channel. Exactly. And if you want to even bring and expand those controls over the center section, it's just a matter of focusing the channel, and now mm -hmm. you have total control over that yeah. channel over there. That's, yeah. that's you see everything in one cool. view. Yeah. Of course, I and see. And you don't need to move out of the middle, which is... That's, uh, that's another very important, that's actually a feature that you find, I don't know, on the S6, on all of those mm -hmm. uh, control exactly. surfaces, because that's one of the yeah. main challenges, to be able to bang channels, make sure that you can control them from the sweet spot, especially right. in a big room like this. Yeah it gets really, really, really important. All right. And in terms of sound, I'm sure that this is as clean as you can possibly get. It's very clean, but it's not sterile. I okay. mean, this is um, what you often think about digital consoles is that they don't have character. They don't have uh, warmth or they don't have um, special, yeah, a, 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 a nice sound. A tone, yeah, yeah. something that yeah. you can take something out of it. Something characteristic. And I find this um, digital console has a very warm sound, okay. but a very transparent sound as well. So, um, tons of headroom. Yeah, tons of headroom. And uh, I mean, if if I mix sometimes with film scores, I, I mix 200, 300 channels together. <laughs> you need that. Headroom. I, yeah, and and it still sounds open. It still sounds transparent. Yes. The summing of this uh, console is great. And also, what I love about this, every single um, function is automatable. Okay. And, um, so everything. Everything. Gotcha. Routing, faders, levels, mm -hmm. knobs, everything uh, is an, an auxiliary sense and pannings. Everything is automatable. Everything is uh, saved within a desk setup. And The recall uh, is fairly okay. The recall is basically... The good thing about it is it's not like on an analog desk where you have inserts, for instance, yeah. where you have to, uh, to patch a lot. To look, yeah. Because here you can say on this channel, for instance, I want a certain piece of gear. You wouldn't go and say, oh, this is channel 22, so I have to patch that piece Gen of gear yeah, into, into the inter into 22, and return. Yeah. But I can just tell him, okay, my gear is at 15, for instance. Take so the source there. Exactly. Go out to 15, come back in yeah. from 15, and then you have it. That's brilliant. Yeah. Saves That's you a lot of cables. Saves you a lot of cables, <laughs> indeed. I mean, sometimes they don't realize it really takes a lot of effort to properly recall a mix, especially right. if it's on an analog console. Yeah. And to make sure that everything is going to be sounding exactly the same means that you need to recalibrate everything yeah. and making sure. Yes. So that takes a lot of time. And then uh, keep comparing my original yes. and what have I now. So that you're going to so always... What is the difference? There is something and there's maybe one button that's tiny. And man, that is super yes. trivial and it's... and uh, when Forget you get, that with this one. This I mean, is just... Yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing. And to Recall have... Uh, takes two minutes. Yeah, I mean, I love that. So, and I'm sure you're using plenty of uh, outboard preamps. I mean, I've seen 48 <laughs> Mm -hmm. in the live room, which is the proper way. Yeah. So they're closer to the source and yeah. you get balanced line outs yeah. straight up. I have 60 uh, Neve preamps. So you got more in I there? I have 12 here okay. and 48 out there. Yep. This is because the desk itself doesn't have preamps. Yeah. These are the preamps of the... So this uh, is accepting line ins. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we we try to be as close, as you said, uh, with the source. Makes total uh, sense. To, to go uh, on to line level. And then basically the signal goes into the machine room where it's Just seen. By, by the Neve converters will be transformed from analog to digital. And as of that moment, it always stays digital in this room. We have a, a digital Pro Tools system, 96 in and 96 out. Yep. And I have a second uh, Pro Tools system for printing the masters. I have my Pro Tools 1 is my tape machine, I would say. Gotcha. 
goes through the desk and then my masters will be recorded on the second right. system so. because doing film score you right. often need to record stems, yeah. 5.1 stems and some, sometimes it's 10 of them. So I can record through a MADI uh, stream 56 uh, channels you have into, a my, in yes, right. into my, so my proto system. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about the preamps. Yeah, I, have, I mean, I have a choice of preamps. I have uh, can see that. Uh, a couple of, well, normally there's two more um, modules of uh, tube deck preamps in there. They have been borrowed for a demonstration. I kind of spotted them in the oratorium. In the oratorium, exactly. <laughs> because this is not really a, a recording area. They don't need preamps, but uh, Wilfried, they were doing some Wilfried came in yesterday night and stuff. said, oh, we need preamps. I, I can't find any preamps. And I said, OK, get these ones because I have There you go. <laughs> for now, so a no couple problem. of uh, tube deck preamps. Right. Right. Um, and then yeah, some summits down there as well. If we go further, we see all my compressors. Yeah, when we, you know, when I access the room, the first time a few minutes ago I was like oh, wait so you basically have planned this so that you get all of your front end mic preamps yes. and compression yes. so dynamic sections onto that side of the rack yes. and all of the EQ and time-based effects onto this side yeah I wish I could do back and forth my life in here because <laughs> that means uh, you're having fun but that you have a lot of blue gear I see so mm -hmm. the tube tags yeah Big fan of it. I am a big fan of it because it's so simple. There's not a, a lot of menus, buttons. <laughs> We're talking uh, about the, the big knobs and being big able knobs, to. Big knobs, easy. They do what you expect them to do, and you turn it down, it's, it's less. You turn it up, it's more. That's what I love about. Um, and then besides, obviously, this, the tube sound is yeah. just amazing. And then uh, it is a, an advantage to have if you have a digital environment I was to have ask you all these analog things. If you want to add a little bit of this analog warmth, tube warmth, you can pass through uh, the units. You just pass through the units. I mean, this room has been um, built into an Oro 3D room in yeah. 2009. Okay. So meaning that these speakers have been built that in the walls. Yeah. It has been a total uh, revamp of the room. Everything has been emptied. It was just the, the concrete walls and those two speakers were there because before it was a stereo room with just those two uh, big Genlex speakers. So all of the ceiling, the skyline, everything. It was, it was even lower. It was like in the other rooms that you have seen. Yeah. And then, uh, because we needed the height for the height speakers, yeah. uh, we expanded uh, it to the really up there. Behind this speaker in the ceiling yeah. is the concrete uh, ceiling. You couldn't go any higher. Gotcha. So basically, at that moment, um, since I was already the resident engineer in this room, I got the opportunity to really design it the way I wanted. Cool. So together with, back in the time, the facility manager, we drew plans and he was asking me, how do you want your gear? The classical layout is basically that you have your console and you have a, your gear in Behind the back you. of the console. Yeah. In the room where I was working before, I had this uh, rack that was behind me, it was put on wheels. Yeah. And I could uh, put it to the sides when we were doing film score, because uh, then we could have like the production team come yeah. in, sitting here. We could even put the console further back and have a screen come down so that we could have projection Going on the on. screen. Yeah. And it was more, was more like a, a dubbing stage uh, Indeed. setup. Indeed. And that was an, an invention of Wilfried. So he, he had the idea that a music control room should be multifunctional and you should be able to do dubbings as well. Yeah. But back in 2009, we were already planning to change some rooms into dubbing stages, like uh, fixed dubbing stages. So there was no need in being flexible in this room in anymore. This one. And we were thinking, yeah, shall we do it back again, like with the, the rack in the back so that you can turn around and do that and do that. But I thought, no, I, I actually like the space. Um, I want to use if we put the racks to the sides. And also, if there is a production of nine or ten people in the room, it's much nicer for them to be involved in the listening area. Instead of having a wall of gear behind the yeah. gear. Yeah, so that makes um, sense. And the compromise is obviously if you need to manipulate the sound, you have to go there, come back, listen. Which is but I can live with that. That's that's not a big problem. I mean, I guess it's just a matter of getting really used to it and Absolutely. knowing uh, very well the room, very well the equipment, and kind of realize that you can, yeah, even EQ a violin from that position yeah. because you've been doing hundred times. Having said that, basically, if I EQ a violin, I would do it on the on the desk anyway. And that's the other um, part of the conversation I want to have with you, which is. I know you work with uh, film score, so a uh, huge amount of tracks, mm -hmm. right? And even if you have a huge amount of outboard gear, and even if you plug it all in, you might be able to actually have an insert on each one of them, mm -hmm. let's say so. Yeah. But then it would be such a long time to recall those settings, right. yeah. get them right at the beginning. So I guess you do still kind of a hybrid mix, where yes. a lot of things, a lot of movements happens in happening within Pro Tools, within the DAW. 
I guess also for automation, things that need to change during time? Well, I must, I must admit that I'm a very basic Pro Tools user. So right. Pro Tools for me is not much more than a tape machine. Yeah. I record onto Pro Tools and I play back from Pro Tools and I always mix on my console. So this is your pr processing mixer? Yes. So yes. yes, the only thing I have to do sometimes in Pro Tools is because obviously I, I have only 96 outputs from yep. Pro Tools yep. and uh, uh, that's by far not enough for a film score, so I have to sum. Um, so certain things, things. get pre summed yeah. in there. And for they instance, come out. if you have uh, an orchestra with overdubs, then then the main microphones come out of the same yeah. um, track out of Pro Tools. The creative mixing and automation always happens with me on the, the desk. on the desk. For me personally, maybe I'm old school, but it's very much more uh, ergonomic. Yeah. If you if you do a fader movement on on a desk, or if you do it with a mouse on a, or with a, draw, draw a line uh, or, or you click some, select something, put it up and down. It is, yeah, I, I can understand that it's efficient and that it's very um, easy to do. But for me, it is more musical. It's, it's a weird thing to say, but mixing on the console is more musical than uh, in, in the box. I could not agree more with you. Uh, I think there's a lot of really good side of Pro Tools, uh, the accessibility of it, the Absolutely. fact that everybody can now understand how much impact can have an automation without owning a mm -hmm. flying feeder console. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you can have so many tracks. But on the other end, you're totally right when you're saying that uh, the ergonomics of a console will never be passed by any controls or you know at least within the computer mm -hmm. just by looking at the thing to me is already yeah. putting you off yeah you shouldn't be looking at it you should be listening at it and putting your hands to have some impact on the sound that they're coming out of the yeah. speakers definitely not looking at the lines the, that's no. no but i understand that the up-and-coming engineers of course that's the quick and the best way to get access well to and it. then you always have the uh, the budget thing as yeah. well it yeah. comes down to budget because who has the money to invest in something like this? Only if, major studios. Yes, and then still clients say, oh, but I want to be able to make open adjustments it, open it until the very last moment. Imagine just in the case of a film score, you're just in the middle of the of the chain. Yeah. You're not at the, your product and the end of the music mix is it's, not the end product. No, you got the dialogues, the, the dub, plays, and, yep. and there the music will be manipulated even more again. Correct. And then sometimes, I mean, obviously I print stems so that they can do, if, if they, they, they think that some parts of the mix are too loud, others are not, they can take them down. Composers also prefer to go to the dub and, and have the mix on the Pro Tools. The whole mix the whole open mix up. So oh. that they can, and only have their Pro Tools outputs onto the mixing console, gotcha. which is then the, the pre-mix, so, so yeah. to speak, of the music, and they yeah. can do adjustments as they go. Onto uh, the, in the final singular tracks. Yeah. Okay. If you buy a, a full blast Pro Tools system yep. compared to a full blast digital console yep. with a Pro Tools, because you still need you the Pro Tools need as a tape a machine. Yeah. Yeah. There, are, there's a couple of zeros in between those yes, two products, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So, just want to ask you a couple of things. First, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's something that I, you know, I get asked a lot. If you could give one or two suggestions, tips, call it the way you want it, to up-and-coming engineers. Just to, what, what are the things they should really be focusing on? Is it the gear? Is it the education? Is it the putting a network in place? I mean, even by just by listening at your story, you're like, you know, one of the big things for me was that I got picked up here is because I had multiple language skills. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing happened to me. You know, I was hired on the Lennon bus when there were only three engineers and they were picking up from Europe. And it's like, why do, did they pick me? So, yes. of course, you need to be trained yeah. to be able to operate Pro Tools, whatever comes at you. But on top of it, to have those extra features that, for me, that, that might be opening doors that you would not expect. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the ability to speak more than three languages, it was a door opener, big time. Yeah. So, what, what is your, you know, your main tip for the up-and-coming engineers? Well, I, I would say... All of it. <laughs> <laughs> All of it, yeah. No, personally, I think the most important is not so much the best, the best, the best, the best, the best, cool. but uh, the most important is that you're convinced of yourself. Good. And that you have good ears. Yeah. And even if you have bad ears, but that you, th you, you know what you hear. You have to be good at what you're doing because there's plenty of people out there yeah. that want the job that you want as well. Yeah. So you have to be good anyway. But then secondly, I find it very important that you keep trust in your ears your ears, not yeah. what everybody says, but also if someone like 
criticizes you for it, you have to say, okay, yeah. you're right, you can criticize me, but I still am going to do it this way because there is no right or wrong. There is just uh, taste in a way and yeah. there is, uh, th of course, you can make mistakes, something can be wrong, but supposedly things that are right, yeah. um, sounding this way or that way is just a matter of taste. And you have to be diplomatic. Cool. Because basically, you're not the boss. The boss is the no. client. Client is king. Yeah. You have to be open. And that's also a main thing for young people. Be open. Uh, try things. There is no there is no laws in music mixing or recording. Yeah. I, I would say there isn't. There are no any aren't any rules. There are a couple of rules that uh, are very self-explanatory. Correct. But other than that, trust your ears. I'm a teacher at SE, and the students I every day teach, they all come to class with their opinions mm. that they probably got of forums. Now, of course, there's so much information out there. Some of them is misinformation. Some of mm. them is actually fake. Some of it is just people talking because they have the chance to do it. What I tell them is like, that's great you did that research. Try to apply, try it out mm -hmm. in a real environment, compare it with what the way you were doing it before, see what you like. And there's not gonna be a one answer for no. all of the scenarios. No. So bring up a palette of different techniques that you can utilize. Take informed decisions, not mm -hmm. just take what's been told because somebody bought that piece of gear and thereby he needs right. to say that it's a good piece of gear. Yeah. No, that's what I call buyer remorse on the forums. Yeah. It's like, I bought that, it needs to be the best thing. No, going back to the up and coming engineers, you don't need to have such a you know, full state of the art studio. You need to start somewhere and guess what, now it's so much easier than before. I just wanted to ask you because I see two different kinds of speakers. So I see mains actually, mm -hmm. you know, soft mounted and, then, and those are actually in the 9.1 configuration, right? Yeah, 10.1 if, 10 you, know if you see, yeah, if you got that guy up there. Mm -hmm. And then I can see two near field PMCs. Mm -hmm. Now, without getting into the branding and stuff, what do you use the most? I'm very pragmatic in this. I only have a 5.1 or 9.1 in the large speakers. Right. Well, I could set up a, s a small 5.1 as well, PMCs. Yeah. But basically, when I do 5.1 mixes for cinema, like yeah. for a film score, uh, it is supposed to be played back in the end on bigger speakers because it's in the cinema. Yeah. It's not, you, you, you wouldn't mix that on near fields. You, so yeah. that's why I, I use the, the Genelix. I use the PMCs a lot when I do CD mixes of, of whatever kind because I make my main sound on the Genelix, but I always check them on the small speakers because the PMCs are not necessarily very nice sounding speakers, but they are very transparent and very analytical. They reveal a lot of details that exactly. will be so buried or things, masked. In. Things that you think are perfect on, on the General X, you would switch to the PMCs and, and like, you think, oh wow, there's a lot of high end, or there's something, or the mids are not, uh, not correct, or the cool. balances, there's something comes out too much, pops out too much, or something is hidden. They have a, an incredible depth in, 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 in the there, sound stage. In the sound stage, and, and also, again, they sound crispy, they, they don't sound uh, very, I would say it's not very hi-fi, um, yeah, yeah. but you, you can exactly spot what element of the balance is wrong on these speakers, which is not as easy on the, on the, big, on the ones. big ones. Yeah, I got you. Well, man, thank you so much for having us here. My pleasure. And uh, maybe you're going to see sometimes next soon. I hope so. There was an at, at the back garden of my parents' house, yeah, which is here in front, yeah. So here around? Yeah, that's here around. Yeah. Right. There was an nice... old empty chicken coop, yeah. And okay. there that that was the first idea, yeah. So the first idea that we are going to rebuild a chicken coop in a demo studio. Wow, man. Yeah, that was so it. So that was the first, let's say the first stone you set up yes. to what we are yeah. looking at right now. Yeah.